I w- Hold up. Hold up. Wait a minute. This is Carla Renata, aka the Kirby Critic, and I shoot straight from the hip. Yeah, you know I'm always shooting straight from the hip. <laughs> Let's take a trip around the curve. Take a trip around the curve. Warner Brothers, DC Studios, Warner Brothers Motion Pictures, HBO, CNN Films, and Max joint Sotley to set out to buy the Christopher Reeve Superman documentary. But in the end, Warner Brothers won the bid. Documentary Will and Harper with Will Ferrell lands at Netflix in an eight-figure deal. And Sundance breakout Thelma has been acquired by Magnolia. Amazon MGM Studios acquires a feature-length Celine Dion documentary, I Am Celine Dion. And IFM Films acquires Alex Thompson and Kelly O'Sullivan's Ghost Light. Longtime Law & Order cast member Sam Waterston is stepping aside as Tony Goldwyn joins the cast. Tim Robinson, Paul Rudd, and Kate Mara join the friendship comedy. And Eric Koo is in talks with his Japanese drama Spirit World with Catherine Deneuve as Goodfellas Boards Sales. Mike Schur and Ted Danson comedy series A Classic Spy as their cast. And Jim Carrey will return for Sonic the Hedgehog 3 later this year. Will Arnett's Electric Avenue is on board Crave's first adult animation Super Team Canada. Joel H. Cohen and Robert Cohen are writing. Sarah Bareilles is adapting the interestings into a stage musical with Sarah Rule. Christoph Waltz, Maya Hawk, John Turturro, and John Hamm star in the Billy Wilder movie, Wilder and Me, for director Stephen Frears and producer Jeremy Thomas. Brad Pitt is reuniting with Quentin Tarantino for his final film, The Movie Critic. Suits LA lands a pilot order at NBC. The Empire Strikes Back, baby. Disney is appealing their legal loss to Ron DeSantis in their free speech battle. Tim Burton is to direct Jillian Films' scripted reimagining of Attack of the 50-Foot Woman for Warner Brothers. Pamela Anderson, Kiernan Shipka, Jamie Lee Curtis, Dave Bautista, Brenda Song, and Billy Lord are set to star in The Last Showgirl from Gia Coppola. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice 2 gets an official title and the pick is set for a post-Labor Day theatrical release. Daisy Ridley's movie Young Woman and the Sea is officially swimming from Disney Plus to a May theatrical release. Nathan Fillion launches his production company Collision 33, inking a first look deal with Lionsgate. Michael Shannon and Matthew McFadden are set to star in the President Garfield assassination series Death by Lightning for Netflix. Amy Adams is in talks to star opposite Jenna Ortega in 3000 Pictures adaptation of Clara and the Sun. Maya Erkstein, Mr. and Mrs. Smith star, signs with WME. Jessica Biel and her Iron Ocean Banner signs with UTA. Sony Pictures Classic acquires Pedro Almaldivar's The Room Next Door, starring Julianne Moore and Tilda Swinton. Prince Harry and Meghan Markle are working on a scripted series, two unscripted shows, and a movie at Netflix. Amelia Clark and White Lotus breakout Leo Woodall signed for Hamilton Hodel in UK. Berlin Film Festival has set its international jury, which includes Lupita Nyong'o, Christian Petzold, Anna Hui, and Albert Serra among the names. Miles Teller is circling the Lionsgate and Universal Michael Jackson biopic, and Nia Long is set as the matriarch, Katherine Jackson. 28 Days Later Legacy sequel lands at Sony after a bidding war, and the Chicago Tribune Orlando Sentinel plan a one-day strike with five other Tribune newsrooms. The walkouts were set for Thursday. Stand by your NDA. Showtime sued by the estate of Tammy Wynette's fifth husband over the depiction in the miniseries, and Donnie Yen is set to star in 87 North's Kung Fu movie for Universal Pictures. Taraji P. Henson and Terrence Howard are teaming up again, joining the cast of Peacock's Muhammad Ali limited series Fight Night. Linda Cardellini, Edie Patterson, Tim Heidecker, and Toby Huss join Ben Stiller and David Gordon Green's Nutcrackers for Rivulet Films, Rough House Pictures, and Red Hour Films. Jackie Tone, Sarah Podinsky, Aya Cash, Judah Lewis, Seth Green Maxwell, Jacob Frieden, and more rap filming on the Jewish summer comedy The Floaters. Cineflex writes, snaps up Greg Johnson from ITV Studios. Ray Fiennes is set to direct and star in The Beacon. 
Byron Allen makes a $30 billion bid for Paramount Global in debt and equity, and Black Bear signs breakout writer-director Ina Sintajarek. Director Sam Hargrave boards Paramount's Kill Them All, and Geraldine Vitswanathan joins Marvel Studios picture stepping in for Ayo Edabiri, who departs the project due to scheduling. Kevin Bacon and Kira Sedgwick are set to star alongside each other in a movie for the first time in 20 years. Kiki Palmer reteams with Aziz Ansari for his directorial debut, Good Fortune, starring Keanu Reeves and Seth Rogen. SNL 1975 finds its Garrett Morris, Dan Aykroyd, and Chevy Chase in Lamorne Morris, Dylan O'Brien, and Corey Michael Smith. Ben Feldman stars in the Australian comedy crime series Population 11 from Lionsgate. Reba McIntyre reunites with her Reba team on a new NBC comedy pilot, and The Color Purple's Corey Hawkins is set to star in The Man in the Basement for Disney's ESPN's Anscape. The new woman of steel is House of Dragons' Millie Alcock. Congratulations, girl. Kate Micucci is developing an animated series toy based on the Keen Spot comic. Chris Rock is set to direct another round remake for Apian Way, Make Ready, and Fifth Season. Grammy's night, y'all, so I'm not going to hold you for long. But before I let you go, I'm going to do a little review on Scrambled. I'm also going to hit a review of Cynthia Erivo's latest film, Drift. We're going to talk about Netflix's Orion and the Dark. I have an interview with Miss Shayla, who's one of the producers and directors of Gospel Live, a PBS special that will has been curated by Dr. Henry Louis Gates, set for February 12th. We'll be talking about Argyle, and guess what? It's not about a cat. And I have interviews with the cast of Dune, including my little baby, who's not a baby anymore, Zendaya, Miss Florence Pugh, and Dave Bautista. All that and more coming up on The Curvy Critic with Carla Renata right now. Hold up. up. Wait a minute. This is Carla Renata, a.k.a. The Curvy Critic, and I shoot straight from the hip. Yeah, you know I'm always shooting straight from the hip. (laughs) Let's take a trip around the curve. Hi, everybody. How you doing? What is shaking? What is popping? It is Grammy Sunday. And like I said, I am not going to hold y'all, but I'm going to move back from this computer because I feel like I'm right on top of it. Let me move this way. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for joining me. If this is your first time popping in, I am your host, Carla Renata. You have tuned into The Curvy Critic with Carla Renata. This is a virtual podcast with visuals and whatnot. And what we do here is we do reviews of films and we talk to people above and below the line in the film industry. I usually talk about what I did the day, the week before, before I begin. And if you are on YouTube, give me a big thumbs up so that I know that you were here. If you're watching via Facebook or any other social media platform, welcome, holla at your girl. I can talk to you all at the same time. I know many of you tuned in to see the interview with Zendaya that is coming on a little later in the broadcast. But what I did not say in the round the curve is I wanted to give homage and tributes to these people. When I lived in New York and I was on Broadway, I ran into this dancer who was legendary and we were doing something from Little Shop of Horrors and she walked up to me and told me that she thought I was brilliant and I was in tears because I couldn't believe that she said that to me. That person that said that to me was Cheetah Rivera. Cheetah Rivera lost her life this week at the age of 91 and we will miss her. We also lost Hinton Battle who was the original Scarecrow in the Broadway production of The Wiz. He is the only male Tony Award winner to have three Tonys. And we also lost Carl Weathers, who is best known for playing Apollo Creed in the Rocky franchise, culminating a 50-year career in Hollywood, which I don't think any Black man can say in these days and times. I also wanted to give a big shout out, because it is Grammys weekend, to Mr. Uncle Charlie Wilson, who celebrated his birthday this week and also got a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. I told y'all last week I was going to be at the Griot with shenanigans, and I was with my girl Monique Judge (laughs) and Mark 
right there. So you can go to the griot.com and see what we were doing over there. But I took that little screenshot so that y'all could see the shenanigans that we had. I also wanted to give a big shout out and congratulations to two dear friends, Travel Anderson and Jared Hill, who have been nominated for a NAACP Image Award for their outstanding literary book about Black phrases. They worked really hard on that project. Both of these gentlemen were part of the National Association of Broadcast Journalists. Travell led it up for a while and then he passed the baton to Jarrett. And, you know, they've been very supportive of me throughout my film journalism career and I wanted to give them a shout out. Again, in honor of the Grammys, just wanted to give you a few little tidbits. Ella Fitzgerald is the first black woman to win a Grammy ever. Put some respect on her name. Stevie Wonder is the first black artist to win album of the year. Put some respect on his name. Natalie Cole was the first black woman to win album of the year. And I know y'all love some Beyonce. Beyonce has garnered the title of being the most awarded artist in Grammy history. The most awarded artist in Grammy history. I wanted to bring you guys Scrambled, a review of Scrambled, but I'm having problems getting that film up. So I will put that on my site, thecurvyfilmcritic.com, and you can catch it there. But I'm going to start out my reviews with this one right here. It's called Orion and the Dark. And it is the cutest little thing. I love I loved this, this particular movie so very much. It's on Netflix. You guys can see it on Netflix. It's been up there since February 2nd. And basically... Is directed by this guy named Sean Charmitz and Paul Walter Hauser, who just won an Emmy, and Jacob Tremblay. We remember him from the movie with Brie Larson a while ago. They're both voicing the lead characters. And the thing about Orion is that he has a huge fear of the dark. And when the embodiment of his worst fear pays him a visit, dark, voiced by Paul Walter Hauser, <laughs> whisk Orion away on a roller coaster ride around the world to prove there's nothing to be afraid of at night shenanigans ensue. This is what I love about this. It's a great lesson um, in having a sketchbook to record your fears so that you can go back and look at it and go, okay, that wasn't so bad. It's a great lesson for adults and kids um, about embracing your fears. You might find something really great on the other side of it. Um, and we've all been there, right? So the trick is to not let your fear get in the way of living your life. I remember during the Color Purple press tour last year, a lot of people spoke to Taraji P. Henson, myself included. And I remember she shared with me that playing Shug Avery scared her to death because it was out of her comfort zone. Sometimes you have to go out of your comfort zone to, to fly and to soar. And in real life, when you are out here, there are no second chances. You got to live your life right now. You have no second chances and don't let anybody get in the way of that joy. I love that they dealt with dealing with bullies, dealing with trying to talk to girls, being afraid of the dark. And I love that they brought the things that keep you awake and afraid in the dark because I am somebody that is deathly afraid of the dark. I cannot stand being in the dark. I have night lights everywhere. You see that light behind me that's pink? That bad boy is on in the middle of the night so that there's light in the room so I can see what the hell is up in here if I happen to open my eyes in the middle of the night. <laughs> the people that the, the embodiments were sleep, quiet, insomnia, unexplained noises, and sweet dreams. So that is Orion in the Dark. And it's on Netflix right now. You guys really should check it out. It's really something else. The other film I wanted to talk about, Cynthia Erivo is one of my favorite artists, right? I talk about her on this show often. She has a film that's called Drift. And it's starring her and this young lady who is playing her, who plays Callie. And her name, I'll tell you her name in a minute. But this is a deep little film only because... Cynthia plays this young Liberian woman who's a refugee, and she barely escapes her war-torn country when she settles on this Greek island. And her daily struggle for survival keeps her terrible memories at bay as she becomes close to this American tour guide. The American tour guide's name is Callie. She's played by Aaliyah Shawat. And when I tell you these two women hold this film all the way down, at the heart of Drift, Jacqueline 
is struggling to belong. She's struggling to define her, define her existence. And um, this film was originally supposed to be directed by Bill Paxton. He passed away, but they reached out to his wife and his wife gave her permission and extended them the courtesy of moving forward with the film as she said he would want it to be made. It's based on Alexander Maxick's 2013 novel, A Marker to Measure Drift. And I'll just say for the first hour of this film, it's about an hour and a half, hour 32. For the first hour of this film, Jacqueline is scrounging around looking for money. She's giving beachside foot massages. She's running from the other people that are scamming on the beach. She's fitting in shadows and dodging bigoted police. All of this is going on until she meets Callie, who is a tour guide. And for whatever reason, Callie never gets angry at Jacqueline. She's totally empathetic with Jacqueline. She doesn't know Jacqueline's story. All she knows is that in her gut, she feels like Jacqueline is lying, but she embraces her and she um, becomes a friend to her anyway. It's a beautiful, beautiful film. We see some glimpses every once in a while of, of Jacqueline when she had long braids. Her father was was a um, an, the head of the embassy. He was a minister there in Liberia. He was the minister of Liberia. Um, and what I feel about this film, as beautiful as it was, I feel like Callie and Jacqueline's characters were a little underdeveloped. I would have loved to have seen more about how they got to where they are, where they came from, maybe to see where they're going because we're kind of left hanging at the end. So that's Drift. It's in theaters right now. If you have an opportunity to see it, y'all, please do. It is a beautiful, beautiful film. Gospel is a PBS special that is coming on February 12th through the 13th. And I had the opportunity to speak with one of the directors, Shayla. And here is that interview with her. Take a look and a listen to this interview with Shayla about gospel, which is presented by historian and genealogist Henry Louis Gates. I was at the taping of the gospel concert and I was living my entire life. And this is what I loved about the actual concert that you were able to see and hear through the introductions of the various artists involved where gospel music started from, the whole evolution of gospel. And I know you've worked with Dr. Gates twice before on some projects. So how did you guys come to this particular project and why did you decide to approach it from the evolution of gospel by including the artists that you did? And gospel sort of became, emerged out of the Southern tradition of blues and spirituals and um, became its own genre uh, in Chicago during the great migration um, to the present day. So we sort of look at two centuries of um, of gospel music um, throughout the years and how it's um, evolved uh, to reflect a lot of the um, other art forms that African-American musicians and artists have created like hip hop and jazz and R&B and soul and um, the sort of back and forth cross pollination between um, those two things and how they've influenced this um, church expression. Well, it's fabulous. I loved it. I cannot wait to see the series in its entirety because I got my entire life with the concept that you guys put on. And what is the one thing that you want people to take away from when they see this series? Because I know for me personally, it was very rewarding. It was very enlightening and very educational. But is there anything else that you would want people to take away from it? Well, I think, uh, the one thing that I do want people to take away is that you you don't have to be African-American to appreciate this. And you don't actually have to be someone who has a faith tradition or even goes to church. Um, a lot of these songs, as we, we came to understand in our exploration of the series, have become American songs like Amazing Grace or um, things like that, that people don't even realize started as gospel songs, but they sing all the time, or Aretha Franklin, um, you know, when they're bop into her, her roots come out of the church and come out of gospel music. So hopefully this series will give people some insight into the things they already appreciate and understand where it comes from mm -hmm. um, and maybe, you know, enhance their Spotify playlist to listen to more things that they didn't know about. Cool. Well, I thank you so much for taking time. Thank you for your patience with me today. It's been a busy day. <laughs>
but I appreciate it. And I can't wait for people to check it out. Good luck with everything. (laughs) Take care. All right. Bye. bye. All right. That was Miss Shayla Harris, you guys. She is one of the directors and producers of Gospel. It's coming on PBS February 12th and 11th. I'm sorry, February 12th and 13th. And there is a concert that goes in tandem with it. Erica Campbell is singing the plaster off the church, y'all. It is everything right in time for Black History Month. I just want to give y'all that little tidbit. Next and last but not least, I'm going to talk about this film called Argyle. And no, it's not about a cat. (laughs) So Argyle is a Universal Pictures joint um, in tandem with Apple TV+. Plus. It is directed by Matthew Vaughn. And it's about this reclusive author who's played by Bryce Dallas Howard. Let me come back on camera. Um, Played by Bryce Dallas Howard. She is this uh, best-selling espionage book author. And she writes about this secret agent named Argyle, who's on a mission to unravel global spy, to unravel a global spy syndicate, right? However, when the plots of her books start to mirror and covet actions of real of a real life spy organization, the line between fiction and reality get blurred. So like I said, it's not about a cat. They use that cat in all them promos and you're thinking, oh, this is about a cat that's wearing an Argyle sweater. No, it's not. <laughs> It is about what I just said it's about. Let me just say, I love Bryce Dallas Howard. She can do no wrong for me. And her being in this action lane is where she thrives. And I love seeing her in the action lane where comedy meets drama because we don't see women navigate in that lane very often. And she is wonderful at it. We get to see Sam Rockwell dance again. The dance sequence between him and Bryce is giving me Mr. and Mrs. Smith comedy vibes all day long. The soundtrack is fire. There's many plots plot twists and turns here and there, which make the film smart. It makes it fun. It makes it interesting. It does take a really long time to get there. Like I would say the last half of the film is when it really starts to cook, but that doesn't detract from what I just said. Henry Cavill is giving me Jamie Dornan vibes and he's hilariously kitschy as Argyle. What I will say is I feel like it was a waste of Ariana DeBose's talent proving that this Oscar curse thing might be real because she's literally in that film a total of maybe 20 minutes. And I just felt like it was a waste of her talent. That young lady's really talented. So Hollywood, if you're watching, producers, directors, if you're watching, please give this girl something that is worthy of her talent. She's got skills. Give it to her. Let her exercise her chops, the same chops that got her the Oscar, okay? And I'm off my my soapbox. Dua Lipa is having a good year, y'all, because between Barbie and this cameo turn, she is living her best life. That's all I have to say about that. So let me just reiterate the films that I did speak about. Let me go down here. Here we go. The films that I did speak about, I talked about Argyle. I said that you're going to see Scrambled on my site. Go to Netflix and check out Orion and the Dark, check out Drift, and the Grammy Awards is live, y'all. So we already have two winners. We already have two winners. Barbie, let me go to my notes so I can tell you what Barbie actually won. Barbie has won. Dun, 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 dun. Barbie, the Barbie soundtrack, What Was I Made For by Billie Eilish has already won. The Oppenheimer score has already won. And SZA are among the winners in the full broadcast that will begin at five o'clock. That's why I'm talking fast and furious. I also wanted to let you know that the London Critics Circle Awards, The Zone of Interest, and All of Us Strangers swept the top prizes. All right. So now for what all of y'all came here for, but let me get into these comments real quick. So I want to thank my boy, Brandon, because he is always here. He says, we're a month away from Kung Fu Panda 4. I know we are. And Natty, yes, I am live. Just so that you know, I am live. Thank you, XOXO Kiss, for joining me. And yes, Will Katoria, we are up right now. And who is this? Now I want to give Argyle a try. I wasn't interested before. Hey, listen, Argyle is fun. I'm just saying it's a lot of fun. Check it out. All right. So now the the interview that y'all are all here for, let me give you some insight into it before I get into it. I was on a 
I say on this podcast all the time that I'm an actress in addition to being a film critic critic and a podcaster. I have a degree in journalism and broadcast production from Howard University. So I decided to exercise it and make good use of it in between my acting gigs. But a while ago, I was on a show on Disney, on the Disney channel called Shake It Up. And I played um, Marcy, who was the mother to Zendaya, who played Rocky. So I've been having a year of full circle moments. I told y'all a couple of weeks ago how I had this full circle moment with Oprah when I um, sat next, sat with her at the Critics' Choice Awards. My pageant coach had been trying to introduce me to her for, for years, and I finally got to meet her. I got to thank Robert De Niro. I got to uh, see one of my friends from Living Biblically, David Crumholz, who's in Oppenheimer. Um, I, I'm having... 2024 is like a full circle moment year for me for whatever reason. And that doesn't detract from the fact that this week I got to do the Dune Junket and I got to talk to somebody who is near and dear to me, Zendaya. So when I met Zendaya, she was a little nugget. I call her a little nugget. She's not a little nugget anymore. She is a full fledged grown woman who is a global superstar and doing all kinds of things. I'm so incredibly proud of her. I can't even handle it. And this is the first time that we have been able to sit down in this capacity to speak about any of her projects. In addition to speaking with Zendaya, I spoke to Florence Pugh, who's also in the film, and Dave Bautista. So without further ado, take a look and a listen to my interview with the Dune cast, including Zendaya, Florence Pugh, and Dave Bautista. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm good. Okay, sorry. Right. That's good. One of my many TV mamas. Yeah. Oh, I was her yeah. first TV mama. Let's yes. make it the same. Really? Period. The first TV mama. Period with a T. <laughs> Are you ready? Are you ready? You yeah, it's yeah. Amazing. All right. I'm Carla Renata, the curvy film critic. What's a- up, fam? <laughs> Florence is like, oh, she going to be fun. Yeah, yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so (laughs) both of you women exude a lot of strength and drive and intelligence that would intimidate the most, you know, human of people. But, um, and you use that to fight against the archaic ideology of your elders in the film, right? So having said that, would you say that both of you harness that power in your real life in order to inhabit Chani and the princess with conviction? And are you the type to institute change or lean into the status quo? And I'll start with Florence first. Because you look like you had the answer, sis. Um, <laughs> okay, I actually think I've learned more from Princess Irulan, and I'm trying to adapt, I'm trying to take s- bits of her into my life. Um, I, I think with every character that you play, you are inserting parts of yourself or parts of people around you that you recognize or people that you watch. But most importantly to me, like I, it's definitely, I, I, I draw from my mom or my gran or my sisters or me. I'm always putting pieces of me into characters. Um, so then, yeah, there obviously is a, a bit of her, a bit of her that is a bit of me. Um, I think I'm definitely someone that kicks up a fuss about sometimes stuff that I really shouldn't. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> And I, I, it, it, um, it's noisy sometimes, but I don't think I could live any other way. I think I was, I was raised by a, a really powerful set of women that um, are unbelievably opinionated and just really inject that, and my dad as well, like really injected that into all of us. And there is no other way that I, I could be other than loud, <laughs> <laughs> opinionated, and. Um, and I'd say I'm I'm proud. I'm very proud. So I think maybe that's where I've put that into Princess Irulan. But she's a lot quieter than I am. Yes. Like she she <laughs> holds her cool way better than I would. If I was Princess Irulan, I'd be like, hang on a second. <laughs> People would know. Yeah, exactly. Dad, you Listen, can't ignore me. Listen, I got me. some things to say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. How about you, Z? Yeah, I think you know these these characters and what we, we've been talking about you know, all morning is that they are complicated and complex female mm-hmm. characters that aren't, that show very different types of strength. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, you know, I'm very, yeah, I think Chani is, is, is 
her her conviction and her strength is is you know inspiring really and i think you know i i feel like in my personal life while i don't necessarily have the skills <laughs> physically that she mm -hmm. has you know i i i try to at least embody some of those things and 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 also i think in many ways sometimes in this industry you have to fight for yourself a lot mm -hmm. um and and be in a, you know an advocate for yourself because you might not feel protected or feel supported i know um, I've had that even back when I was a kid <laughs> on the show that we were on yes. together <laughs> and, and having to, um, learn very, very young that you have to be your own protector or mm. support or whatever. And so that's something that I've kind of carried on my back for, for quite a long time. And, and I think it's the reason why maybe I'm a little too intense on myself, you know? Um, so I think if there's anything that I wish for, Chani and for myself, it's to be able to <laughs> breathe mm -hmm. and, 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 and for just, you know, like to accept these moments. I think for her, it's so hard for her to even have a love story because mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's so much, um, pain that she's holding and, and, and she has to protect herself. Um, so I, I, I definitely empathize with that. And uh, I, st you know, I still think she's stronger than I am, but I, I'd like to think that I have little pieces of that. Oh, yeah, you do. You got your mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. Um, so just to lighten it up a little bit, there's this moment about mid to midway to the end where you guys have that glance. The glance. And there's nothing that's said. Mm -hmm. But if you had the opportunity to say something. What do you think they say? I'm interested. We've had this conversation. Yeah. Really? What do you think they say? You're looking at her like... I see you, mm -hmm. and I see why he likes you, but it ain't going to happen. And then you're looking at her like, if you move, I'm going to cut you. <laughs> right. Well, listen, yeah, it's, basically. It's up to the, yeah, interpretation <laughs> is everything. <laughs> um, yeah, there's so much I think that's said in that scene in that moment. And I think, I think we're still trying to figure out yeah. what's to come with, with these characters and, and, and what that glance means, you know. Um, I think there's a lot of... A lot of pain and heartbreak and yeah and and um I don't know I think um I think betrayal what I is obvious my, my characters she, I think I think that's obvious though also to yeah Princess Irulan is like seeing your reaction it's very obvious what's just happened and I think that was the first time in the script when I read Princess Irulan looking at you at Chani sorry I was like oh she's She's always been aware this was transactional. She knows this is a transaction. She knows that this is the bit where she needs to come forward now and she's gonna protect her dad. And I can now see between these two characters that, that they also now need me. Or that this is, it's not just a one-sided deal. Like this is very, very equal. Um, and it's business. Mm. That's another thing. I think, yeah. and I, I, she can recognize that this is a really sad part of business. Yeah. A really sad part. Um, who knows, you know, what comes after that and if where the conversation <laughs> leads between them afterwards. But um, it was definitely an intense, you know, and, and, and we only had that week working together and that was our only bit where we got to interact with each other. And it was like, so powerful in the in the four seconds that we get to look at each other in the yeah. movie um it's very it was very powerful it was very sad seeing her little her little face run out the rooms not it wasn't nice <laughs> i didn't like it yeah it was a very powerful moment and that's yeah. why i wanted to ask you about it so in closing it out i've been a fan of yours like for five thousand years so oh. i'm so happy to be able to finally talk to you oh bless. and i am so proud of you i literally could oh. just bust out of my clothes oh. I can't even handle it right now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Lovely for your to time. talk I appreciate to you. you. It's good to see lovely. you. Oh, lovely to meet you too. It's good to see Bye, you. Bye, Zizi. Um, at the core, this film is a love story, right? Sure. So, do you think that Beast is a little salty that he don't have a love interest in the film? That is is that why? <laughs> is that why he's so just angst all the time? Because he don't have he don't have that, a boo. That's probably that's probably that's probably has a lot to do with it. <laughs> It probably has an awful lot to do with it, yeah. His <laughs> little brother's getting all the girls. He's just there <laughs> with his alcohol. <laughs> Hilarious. What would you say is your fondest memory of being part of this franchise? 
working with actors like Stellan Skarsgård and, and Austin Butler, and uh, not only just being able to work with them, perform with them, and learn from them, but also having the camaraderie off offset. You know. Um, just having conversations with them, talking about everything from A to Z, not just about performing, acting in this industry, but just life in general. And also, I have to say that even though I didn't share a lot of screen time with him, Josh Brolin is one of my favorite people in the world. Um, and it's just because he's lived a full life, and he's he's a very deep person, and he's got a lot of you know good insight on life, and you know he's made mistakes, and he's um, come back from those mistakes. So every conversation with him is a blessing and a learning experience. So. It's, it's, so it's a lot of different experiences that, that make this special. But again, throughout my career, I've had a lot of those experiences with people and actors and directors and crew members and, mm. so, and DPs, and Greg Fraser, I mean. I loved having this moment to talk to you. You're such a gentle, well, kind you. spirit and soul <laughs> yeah, and not the beast that you portray in the film. So thank you for that. your time yeah, today. No, I appreciate thank you. you. Yeah, likewise. All right. Yeah, thank you. Listen. I'm about to get emotional, y'all. I'm about to get emotional. When I tell you that as a child, Zendaya isn't any different now than she was when she was a child. She has always been a very loving, warm, gracious human being. I'm so happy to know that this global success in fashion and in film and with the civil work that she does has not changed her. And I hope that she continues to be as loving and warm as I know her to be. I'm so glad that you guys tuned in to see us interact and clown a little bit because I, I truly have fun with that. And I had a great time getting to know Dave Bautista as well, as well as talking to Shayla Harris about gospel. So next week is the Super Bowl and I will be at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival because I am a juror there for their social justice films where they're honoring Robert Downey Jr., Coleman Domingo, Daniel Brooks among just a few. So I may do a couple of mini live streams from there just to give you guys a glimpse of what's happening there, but I will not do a podcast next week. When I do come back, the following week, which is, what week is that? The following week, which is February 11th, I will talk about the Santa Barbara International Film Festival and my experience there. And then I will do a review of Madam Webb, Driveaway Dolls, and The Taste of Things. I may have some interviews with Driveaway Dolls. I'm not sure just yet, but I'll let you know. So again, I'm Carla Renata, your host. Thank you so thank you so much. I don't know what happened to the signal went away. Well, thank you so, so much for tuning in. If this is your first time joining me, please give me a big thumbs up to let me know that you were here. Click that bell for notifications, subscribe to the channel, tell your friends. And I am so grateful for each and every one of you. Let me give a shout out again to Will, Will what is this? Victoria, XOXO Kiss, Brandon, who also tells me, he says, after the, the Super Bowl next week, I hope we get some spots for Transformer and Kung Fu Fam, Fan, Kung Fu Panda 4, Garfield, Inside Out, just because I'm sure we will. And then he also says that he's going to watch Orin in the Dark and Tiger's Apprentice very soon. Thank you, Brandon. All right, y'all, that does it for me. I am going to go and watch the Grammys with everyone else. I told you I wasn't going to take up too much of your time because I don't believe in doing that when you're trying to get out and do some other things. So love, peace, and hair grease. Until the next time. Love y'all. Deuces. Bye. <laughs>